everyone, and welcome to One Civil Law, where we learn through the misfortunes of others. As always, I hope you enjoy this live legal education content, and today may be the day I earn your subscription. For today's case, we are dealing with an order and judgment from the district court regarding the story of Amaya Cajon. As you may remember, Amaya Cajon was a girl on a, a high school at the time who went to Walt Disney World in February. And as COVID was hitting the nation, the trip ended early, she came back, she had symptoms that were similar to COVID. She was admitted to a hospital, admitted to another hospital where she had her first and I believe only COVID test. The COVID test was itself negative, but there was some suggestion that maybe the test wasn't very good because early days of COVID and also that, the, uh, that there might be a testing window problem with the initial test. Those were the suggestions. The Amaya tried to contact her band teacher and contacted the principal to advise them of all this stuff. And um, as a result of this, word started getting out in the relevant community. So the health authorities started getting calls. The principal started getting calls from many different concerned parents. There was, in fact, in reality, a disruption in the community. People were concerned. Because remember, this is the very, very early days of COVID where we didn't know how bad this thing was, right? We didn't know if it was the Spanish flu. We didn't know if it was a black plague. We didn't know if it's nothing burger. So in the, in the face of unavailable information, people usually spike up the concerns a lot, you know, take, take really sharp concerns in the unknown. So they're getting concerns, wondering if they had to be tested, wondering if they had to be isolated, you know, if they had to go to the hospital, all kinds of stuff. And this was all, and then most notably, there was an Instagram post, which brings us to today's story. This Instagram post, the Instagram post is the thumbnail for this video, is a picture of her in the hospital. Um, and it says essentially in so many words, I beat COVID. But remember there had been a negative COVID test. So because of the way HIPAA does and does not apply, HIPAA is not a barrier here. So the health department told the sheriff there was a negative test, who told the de deputy there was a negative test. And so here, so that's the, that's the situation. And then the deputy went over to the house, de asked slash demanded the, po the post be taken down and at some point threatened to take people to jail on disorderly conduct if that didn't happen. The post was in fact taken down. So the question was, was Amaya Cajon's First Amendment rights infringed? And I suppose parallelly or parallel whether or not the sheriff acted improperly. Okay, so I'm going to give you my legal opinion before we read the court's legal opinion. Now, I want to be noted for the record that my legal opinion doesn't necessarily reflect what I want to be true. Because I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna black pill you. I'm just telling you right now. It's not because I want to. It's not because I think this is a good thing. I think it's a bad thing. But if yours truly is ever fortunate enough to be appointed judge, he will take an oath to uphold the law as it exists, not necessarily as he wants it to be, for better or worse. And this would be one of these worst times in my judgment. So here is my analysis. First of all, as to the officer, if we got that far, qualified immunity. As we all know from our qualified immunity coverage, many, many coverages of it, in order to have qualified immunity, you have, or in order to beat a qualified immunity claim, you have to show a violation of a constitutional right that was critically, clearly established at the time. So we may, we might have a violation of a constitutional right, we'll get to that in a second, and was it clearly established at the time? We also know from our coverage that when we're determining clearly established at the time, we can't look at it too broadly. We can't look at it too generically. So saying First Amendment isn't going to cut it. You have to have something a lot more specific than that. That's not me. That's the U.S. Supreme Court. Okay. You can't look at it at too high a level of generality is exactly the phrase from the Supreme Court. I'm not making this stuff up. So I think it's probably true that this set of circumstances is sufficiently distinct 
from any set of circumstances that I know of in law or probably could be known in law because of the particular situation it is that if we had to get that far, we'd say qualified immunity for the officer. But we don't even have to get that far because qualified immunity assumes that you did that you did something wrong, right? Because there's that whole first tenet. Was the constitutional right violated? Now, let's talk about what the First Amendment does and does not protect, okay? The First Amendment protects lies, right? It doesn't have to be true, but the First Amendment does not protect slander, libel, defamation, fighting words, or, or words that in and of themselves are criminal in their nature. And this would be, and, and um, breaching the peace is an example of that. So if you, Go and breaching the peace is obviously going to be fact specific. So, you know, if you yell at the top of your lungs in the middle of the street, something that's one thing. If you go into your local Starbucks, it's something else. You know, it's a time, place, manner restriction. Or you can even go further and say it's just not covered, period, because it's having deleterious effects. So take your pick time, place, manner restriction, intermediate scrutiny, or just not covered because the words are inherently in and of themselves criminal, not because of the words themselves as such, but because of their it, their effect to cause disruption. So take your pick between either one. So when we're looking at this situation and trying to analyze it legally, we have to look at the situation as it existed at the time. What did the sheriff know? What did the deputy know at the moment he came at the moment he came to the door and started talking? What did the sheriff know? What did the deputy know? The deputy knew there had been a negative COVID test. The deputy knew there had been no positive cases of COVID in the entire county. Early days of COVID. The deputy knew that this Facebook post exists, or Instagram, he called it Facebook, but whatever. He knew this Facebook post exists. He knew the health authority was getting calls. He knew the principal was getting calls. He knew that people were calling each other and this was in fact, in reality, instilling some sort of panic state. That was what he knew. So based on that information, which is always what you have to do at, you have to always look at what you know at the time, was this breach of the peace? And based on the law, as I understand it, I'd have to say yes. Now, it is true that the father told the sheriff slash deputy that they had been told by their doctor that they might have had COVID despite the test. But remember, the deputy didn't know that going in. And he doesn't have to believe anything the suspects might say, right? People say all kinds of shit. So it's like, oh, our doctor told us we had a positive COVID result. You know, that information, information, information might have gone right in and out. What he knew for sure from competent health authority was that there was no positive cases of COVID in the county, and this was a negative COVID test. So based on the information he knew, he has to get either to probable cause or arguable probable cause in order to conduct an arrest. We've discussed probable cause before. It's a very low standard. It's some evidence, pretty much any evidence, that a crime has been committed by the person charged. It's not beyond a reasonable doubt. It's not preponderance of the evidence. It's low. It's really low. On a scale of one to 10, it's one, maybe less. It doesn't take a lot for probable cause. You just have to have a reason to believe that this person has committed a crime. And at this point, the officer has probable cause. The officer has probable cause to believe a crime has been committed. The statute's on the books. Even if it's worded overly broadly as an is a, as applied challenge, it's being applied with what the law certainly had in mind because it is in fact causing a panic in reality and so forth and so forth. So my analysis would be qualified immunity, but I don't even have to reach that issue because the officer was fundamentally justified in his actions because he believed at the time, based on the evidence that was available to him, that he had probable cause, which he did, in order to conduct an arrest. And in lieu of the arrest, demand that the post be taken down, which solves the underlying issue. Incidentally, this would be somewhat similar 
to a person who is being loud and 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 voicious or, or how about a person in a bar even better like a person in a bar who's really yelling at people and really antagonizing people really being a jerk and for whatever reason the you know the the bouncers haven't been able to keep, keep him out, cut him out or maybe they told him to leave and he didn't leave right so with the officer when the officer arrives he could he could do a couple things right they, they've told him to leave so they could arrest him for trespass but he doesn't have to so he could say instead okay guy i'm going to give you one chance here how about you leave and we'll all go on our way and if the guy leaves then the officer says mission accomplished the disruption has been solved everyone moves on with their life right you know this is of course assuming that no one else has been hurt and no property's been damaged right just a straight yelling straight civil ci civil trespass kind of claim officer says look guy why don't you just uh why don't you just call it a day and maybe because the officer's there he finally says fine and he leaves right so it's the op officer giving you an opportunity to stop the viol the underlying violation making everyone happy in lieu of conducting the arrest so that seems to be somewhat parallel here so in my judgment qualified immunity but we don't have to get that far because probable cause or arguable plausible call probable cause for civil disturbance so yeah that was what i said now when we listened to the audio or at least i did and i gave you a summary of it on my channel when i listened to the summary of the audio from the court i came away with a distinct impression the court was going to roll for amaya and i and i said on that stream i said it and you can go look back at it I said, I think the district court is going to rule for Amaya, and I think the district court's going to be wrong. Yeah. The, pr the problem is, the problem is multifold. First of all, the district court can't declare new violations of rights because, or clearly established. Clearly established can only be decided by the court above. Okay, first, let's, let's start, start even simpler than that. Because they're a because they are a, a victorious party, because they are a winning party, that means that they, under statute, can ask for legal fees from the from the other side, right? In a civil rights case, you can ask for legal fees fees from the government. So the government has to pay money, but the government may not want to pay money, right? So they would want to appeal, and the the judgment from the Court of Appeals should be, in my view, the district court doesn't have the power to establish rights. Only the Court of Appeals can decide, decide that. We recently saw that happen very recently on my channel with Business Leaders in Christ and InterVarsity, InterVarsity Christian Fellowship in Christ versus University of Iowa. Remember, we covered this where the Court of Appeals says the district court can't declare new, new rights violated. Only we can do that. All right, so the district court does not fundamentally have the power to establish new clearly established rights. And then you say to my, then you say to me, but Kurt, if the district court can't establish new clearly established rights, then how does a right ever get clearly established? And I'm right. That's a very good question. Yeah, but you know, it's it's kind of a catch twenty two. Once again, I'm not saying it's good. I'm saying it's what's my judgment of the law is. So I said, okay, the district court's about to make a mistake. The district court's about to rule for Amaya, and they're making a mistake, and it's going to get overturned on appeal. So that's what I thought about the case analysis. That's what I thought the district court was going to do. And with all that wonderful prelude being said, now I'm going to read the case, and we're going to critique it like a good court of appeals. Let's get started with this. All right, so we have an order, but you don't need clearly established. What did I just say, Matthew? What did I just say? Are you listening to my, are you listening to me? All right, let's try this again. Do I have to go through the entire explanation again? Were you paying attention for the last 15 minutes? Okay, because they're a prevailing party, that means the government might be so, might be responsible for costs. The government doesn't want to be responsible for costs, so they're going to appeal. So the Court of Appeals has to decide either 
the officer didn't have actual probable cause or arguable probable cause, which he totally did. And assuming that he didn't, they'd have to conclude that qualified immunity should attach to this specific set of circumstances, which I don't think it should. The situation is too novel. So, yeah, you need clearly established because the government's liable for money because the, the because Amaya is a prevailing party. So, yeah, that's my understanding of the law. Clearly incompetent on, on civil law. <sighs> Who's making an ass out of me out of pointing out physical appearance? Christ, I shouldn't read the chat while I'm streaming. Let's read this thing. Fucking bullshit. Okay, sweet Lord. Order granting plaintiff declaratory judgment. The SARS virus, or COVID-2 virus, and COVID-19 have had a tremendous impact on American society. But as this case makes clear, that impact has limits and more specifically does not extend to overriding protections of the First Amendment. This is true. This is absolutely true. On April the 16th, 2020, teenage plaintiff, Amaya... On April 16th, 2020, teenage plaintiff, Amaya Cohon, Amaya, by and through her parents, filed a complaint alleging that the sheriff and the patrol sergeant violated the IMI's first and 14th Amendment rights when Sergeant Klump, at Sheriff Conoth's direction, demanded Amaya remove a social media post detailing her recent hospitalizations with covid light symptoms. As a remedy, Amaya seeks both declaratory and injunctive relief, including an order barring defendants from threatening or taking coercive action against her if she posts on social media in the future about her scare with COVID-19. On April 24th, 2020, defendants moved for summary judgment, and on April and on May the 15th, 2020, Amaya filed her own summary judgment motions. The parties agreed the facts are not disputed. The facts are pretty much not disputed. Indeed, the entirety of the Klumpf encounter with her parents is captured in dash cam video. It sure was. We reviewed the video. Five dollars from Ricardo Ospinia. Relax, man. Don't let negative comments get you down. Also have some beer money. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. That video, along with other record evidence, establishes defendants violated Amaya's free speech rights, demanding that she take down her social media posts or face criminal threat or citation. Judge Mueller disagrees. Accordingly, Amaya is entitled to summary judgment or a declaratory judgment claim, and for the same reasons, defendants' summary judgment must be denied. The court will deny Amaya's request for injunction. That makes sense. Her counsel can see that declaratory judgment would be sufficient, which I totally said, right? I totally said it in my stream. Once they once they once they conceded that point, which he totally did, the court's not gonna do anything else. So no surprise there. So here's some factual background. Uh I guess we can skip the factual background because I told you all the facts, basically. So let's skip all that. In her complaint, Amaya alleges defendant violated her First and Fourteenth Amendment rights when the sheriff sent the sergeant to her home and coerced her into taking down social media posts. She seeks two remedies, declaratory judgment establishing defendants violated her First Amendment rights and injunction in joining the defendants from citing her or her parents for disorderly conduct, yeah. arresting them, jailing them, or threatening any of the above for future posts. The court will grant the first relief but deny the second because Amaya's own counsel in the argument said the first relief would be fine. So that makes that easy. Plaintiff is entitled to declaratory judgment on our first amendment retaliation claims. Yeah. The declaratory judgment act empowers the court to declare rights and other legal relations of any interest party when there's an actual case or controversy. To establish case or controversy, plaintiff must prove that she suffered an injury fact that is in fact traceable to the conduct and that is likely to be redressed by a favorable judicial decision. To establish injury in fact under the First Amendment, a plaintiff may show chilling effect of her speech that is objectively reasonable and self-censorship as a result. Yeah. 
Amai alleges that she removed her Instagram posts and continued self-censor since her encounters with Klump. She also contends that she fears posting about COVID-19 again because it might subject her or her parents to citation or arrest under Sheriff's Department's broad reading of disorderly conduct statute. Now, I will concede the point that the disorderly conduct statute may be overbroad, but as it was applied here, yeah. That Amaya's posts were silenced as a result of defendant's conduct, allegedly in violation of the First Amendment, establishes injury in fact for declaratory judgment. Further, the Seventh Circuit has held Amaya's assumed fear of, fe fear of future sanctions for engaged speech is itself objectively reasonable. When one cannot know what triggers an ordinance such that it will be enforced, he may fairly assume it can and always will be enforced, and the total abstention from protected activity is necessary and to avoid a prosecution. So is this court going to try... Okay, so the only way for this court to get to where it wants to be, the only way for this court to get to where it wants to be is to say, okay, I'm going to turn this into a facial challenge and strike down the statute facially. But, okay, let's see if the court goes with that way. For, yeah, okay, we read that. There's no dispute that Amaya's injuries are the direct result of, and thus fairly traceable to defend them. True. She took down her social media posts only after the sergeant's visit to her home, and because the chilling effect on her protected speech is her injury, and that chilling effect persists, is likely to be redressed by a favorable judicial decision. <laughs> thus, plaintiff has met standing requirements. Well, as to standing, I'll give you that. They have standing. I, I have no problem with standing. The record establishes all three elements of a first retaliation, a First Amendment retaliation claim. As a general matter, the First Amendment prohibits government officials from subjecting an individual to retaliatory actions, including criminal prosecutions for speaking out. As a general matter, that's true. And then we get into the specifics, right, where it may be less true. To prevail on a First Amendment retaliatory claim, a plaintiff must establish three elements. First, they must show that she engaged in First Amendment protected activity. Uh, 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 second, she must show adverse action was taken against her. Third, she must show her protected act conduct was at least a motivating factor of adverse action. Here, plan for satisfied all three elements. Hmm. Even if short and other often grammatically scurrilous, nice. Social media posts do not fall outside the ambit of the First Amendment. This is true. I agree. This is why, by the way, I mentioned my Starbucks example and bar example, right? The same logic would apply anywhere, through any medium, right? Because this is social media, it does not get more or less First Amendment protection. It gets the same amount of protection it would anywhere else. The, the internet is not special. The home might be, but eh. In the eye of the law, when Amaya Cohen took, Cohen took to Instagram, she's no different from John Tinker wearing a black armband. Wow. I mean, a little different. Uh, Tinker was expressing an opinion. Vietnam is bad. That's what the black armband meant. Vietnam, bad. Yeah. He was expressing an opinion. Amaya was expressing facts or alleged facts. I had COVID. I've survived COVID. A hundred people were with her on that bus trip, apparently. It was a band trip of some kind. So... You know, yeah. But defendants disagree. In their view, Amanda forfeited her constitutional protection when she published a post that caused concern in the community and led to an influx of phone calls to the Westfield School District and Marquette, Marquette County Health Department. Right. So that would be the other half of like civil unrest or 
disorderly conduct, right? It did, in fact, cause a disturbance. Not because of opinion, but because of purported facts. Hmm. Even setting aside the popular movie theater analogy actually referred to falsely shouting fire in a crowded theater, which at the time she said it, this is the problem. This is the problem. It may or may not have been true. I mean, it probably was. I mean, she had all the right symptoms, right? So, I mean, what else? It's COVID, right? It's got to be COVID. But I mean, yeah. But strictly speaking, it may or may not be true, but it's probably true. But we have to put ourselves in the mind space of the people at the time and what they knew as they were performing their actions. You know, we don't we don't give people hindsight hindsight penalties or benefits, incidentally. You know, you can't lock yourself into things because the facts turned out well or poorly. Yeah. $7 from Laura Myers. If social media were a thing in 1937, then people on the Hindenburg say, here before this plus. <laughs> Cute. While content-based speech restrictions are permissible in limited circumstances, such as incitement, obscenity, defamation, fighting words, child pornography, and so forth, the Supreme Court has rejected as startlingly and dangerous a flea froating test for First Amendment based on ad hoc balancing of relative social costs. True that. Labeling censorship socially beneficial does not render it lawful. If it did, nearly all censorship would evade First Amendment scrutiny. Well, I don't know about that, but... Defendants have, may prefer to have keep Marquette County residents ignorant of the possibility of COVID-19 in their community for a while longer. Well, it wasn't the possibility so much as someone stating it for a fact. So they could have avoided having to field calls from concerned citizens. That would be the... Uh, disorderly of the disorderly conduct, but that preference does not give them authority to hunt down and eradicate inconvenient Instagram posts. Eh. A Maya's post is not captured by any of the categorical exceptions of the First Amendment, so this court will not balance the social utility of curtailing it against the government's assigned value. But defendants persist. They cast a Maya's characterization of her illness as a lie which is going too far for the defendants, incidentally. They didn't need to go that far. Insisting that because she ultimately tested negative, she was prohibited from publicly claiming that she had beaten COVID-19. But the very doctors who tested her informed her that she might have had COVID-19 in spite of a test. Yes, they informed her. But that information was not known to the sheriff's deputy or the sergeant when he arrived. And yes, Amaya's dad told him, but then again, people say all kinds of shit, so why would he necessarily believe him? Again, not necessarily what I want the law to be, but I'll give you my opinion, my legal opinion anyway. Her Instagram posts were at, therefore at worst incomplete. The notion that the long arm of government, redaction pen in hand, can extend to the sort of incomplete speech is plainly wrong. The Marquette County Sheriff had no more ability to silence Amaya's post than it would be to silence the many talking heads on cable news who routinely pronounce one side hot takes on issues of the day, purposely ignoring any inconvenient facts that might disrupt their narratives. Let me help you out on that one, Court. As you just sort of mentioned, the talking heads are bringing opinions mentioning opinions. And yes, they ignore facts that are inconvenient. Right. But they're expressing opinions. So, yeah. And the opinions aren't of the nature of, you know, there's a biological contamination currently in the city of whatever when the relevant authority says, no, they're not. You know, that's, yeah, they can't, it, I, I, I don't think the talking heads on CNN can induce a panic either. Eh. Indeed, even if Amaya's post had been untruthful, which is irrelevant, 
No court has ever suggested that non-commercial false speech is exempted from the First Amendment. This much is true. I agree with the court. It doesn't have to be true to be protected by the First Amendment. Lies are protected by the First Amendment. I agree as to that much. But then again, like, disorderly conduct isn't, remember, because the nature of the conduct isn't because it's true. Like, you could go into a Starbucks and just start yelling at the top of your lungs, you know, the sky is blue, the sky is blue, right? It's still disorderly conduct. The truth value of it is irrelevant. The Starbucks has a particular, particular atmosphere that you are disrupting. You are ruining everyone else's good time. The Starbucks is not your personal space. You know, you can go outside the Starbucks on the street corner and Starbucks will have to be annoyed, but they can't stop you. But if you step inside the Starbucks, yeah. So the truth value is irrelevant. But if it's actually causing a disruption, like, you know, this guy in the Starbucks, I think the police can act. The Supreme Court has emphasized that the remedy for that for speech that's false is true. This is the ordinary course in free society. Man, true that. True that. Um, yeah, I mean, I couldn't agree with that more. Cohen versus California. Uh, yeah, it was, yeah, I mean, Justice Brandeis. Right. Brave, brave men don't try a silent speech. The cure for the cure for bad speech is more speech, not enforced silence. So it says Brandis. So yeah, I, I I tend to agree. This is the ordinary course in a free society. The government here had every opportunity to counter the speech, but then stopped instead to engage in the objectionable practice of censorship. <sighs> Because her Instagram, yeah, see, that doesn't work in the real world, right? Because also, like, the truth value is irrelevant. So, I mean, if we switch up the hypothetical and the guy in the Starbucks is yelling, the sky is magenta, uh, the fact that the government can use its own mechanisms to, say, report sky is and still fact blue is not solving the underlying problem. The disruption is the issue the disruption of people's space, the panic that is being induced. Either way, take your pick. Defendants took adverse action against plants. Is Matt trying to spoil things again? I swear to God. The, defense, the government had every opportunity to counter a Maya speech, but opted instead to engage in objectionable practice of censorship. Because her Instagram post was undoubtedly protected by the First Amendment, yeah. The court finds Amaya satisfied the First Amendment. This this uh, judge is less sure over here. Defendants took adverse action against plaintiffs. The standards for determining whether an action is sufficiently adverse to constitute retaliation is well established, likely to deter a person of ordinary fitness. The Supreme Court has often noted realistic threat is enough to chill First Amendment rights. Sure. Thus, realistic threat of a arrest established adverse action for retaliation purposes. Yes. The audiovisual recording at the home shows Mr. Cohen being threatened. If the, if the post doesn't come down, the, the sheriff has directed me to issue disorderly contempt citations, if not start taking people to jail. Right? See, for example, guy being disruptive at the bar. If you don't, if you don't stop sh opening your mouth, I'm going to arrest you for disorderly conduct. See the guy at the Starbucks. If you don't stop yelling things, I'm going to disrupt, I'm going to arrest you for disorderly conduct. Right. Is that censorship? Not really. Yeah. According to the defense, though, because Sergeant Clump never made this threat to Amaya, instead uttering only when the father was present, could not purposely experience any action. Yeah, that's bullshit. The father was told Amaya. That superficial analysis fails for a number of reasons. First, the record makes clear that Clump's intention throughout the 30 minutes was to get Amaya to remove her social media posts through the use of threats. True. That he expressed this intent only during his discussions with Amaya's father after Amaya retreated in the house to comply does not mean she was not the realistic subject of the threats true Shit. 
I'm doing my... After Sergeant Clump left, I was afraid he'd find my first post and come back for that one, so I declared to leave that post too. I'd also like to post further about my scare with COVID-19 on social media and repost the post I've removed, but I'm afraid another officer will come to my home and cite my parents or arrest me. Fair. So not only was Sergeant Clump's threat of arrest likely to deter a person of ordinary fitness from engaging in protected conduct, in this case, it did just that. Further, the video of Sergeant Clump's interactions with Ms. Mr. Cohen Cohon showed the police officer twice in a mice present declined to contradict Mr. Cohen's assertion the th sergeant department was threatening to take him to jail. Yeah, it doesn't really matter either way. It doesn't matter either way because even if we can assume for an absolute fact that Amaya didn't hear it, we can reasonably assume, uh, assume that as they were discussing it, her father probably mentioned it. So, you know, that's enough. This was a very real, thank you, Noli, for the, Noli, for the donation. This was a very real arrest, both of a person of ordinary fitness and particularly a 16-year-old child. The threat was real. I agree with that. Analogizing to a citizen's ability to consent to warrantless police search of their property, defendants argue Mai's decision to acquiesce render her actions voluntary. Yeah, that's BS. That's BS. Her actions are not voluntary. They're coerced. That's rubbish. Defendant, and again, it would be coerced in the Starbucks example, the bar example. Defendants correctly allude to the importance between different government expression and intimidation, the first protected by the First Amendment and the latter forbidden. True. In First Amendment retaliation context, what matters is the distinction between attempts to convince and attempts to coerce. Fair. Defendants ask the court to lump Clump's efforts into an attempt to convince basket. No. Amaya agreed to delete her Instagram post prior to learning of the threats. How then can she ask, can she claim coercion? No. This argument ignores the inherently challenging and coercive nature of a uniformed officer showing up at a teenager's home and demanding that she see speech. I agree. I think it's coercive. Sergeant Clum's dash code and failure shows it was not passive persuasive rhetoric that led Amaya to delete her social media posts, but rather his demand, Matthew gives me $10 saying, sorry, did not mean to spoil anything. My bad, you're great. Thank you, Matthew. We need to get taken down. That was coercion by any metric. Agreed. The state cannot dispatch law enforcement to the home of the teenager to demand that she remove her Instagram posts that government officials disagreed with and claimed that they were only engaged in the Socratic method. Well, it's not really Socratic because they weren't asking questions. But, point taken, it's possible that Westfield Administrator or Marquis County Health Department employee could have engaged in mutually respectful discussion with a mind to convince her to retract her post. Yes, that is a factor. The fact that they sent the police rather than anyone else is a thing. I agree. That's coercive. I get, I'm, I'm on board with coercive. So I agree. I agree with the court on fact two. I agree with them on court two, part two. It's coercive. Yeah. Part two of the analysis, the court's right. No problem. The third element of a claim of retaliation under the First Amendment requires a plaintiff to show adverse action she suffered was motivated by her protected conduct. The key words there being protected conduct, see our discussion relative to point one. A motivating factor does not amount to a but-for factor or only factor, but rather just a factor. Any factor. Any factor at all, you can't do it. On this element, defendants graciously carry plaintiff's burden for her. Nice. Following the encounter of the house, Sergeant Clump filed a detailed incident report that the sheriff re reviewed. With the report, they conclude, they conceded, sheriff advised me that he wished for me to respond to the residents and had me post the rose from social media. Yeah. And when I advised them to remove the post, he became upset. By defense on admission, then the entire purpose for Clump's visit was, and by extension, the motivation for the arrest. Yeah, so, so far, so far, in at least my humble legal opinion, as the law as I understand it, I don't agree with the court on factor one. 
I agree with the factor quarter on factors two and three. And of course, I'm hiding it's all three to win. So I am not convinced at this time that, yeah. So let's read more. Defendants cannot stay, establish liability by involving, invoking probable cause or qualified immunity. Really? Okay. Well, if the court can change my mind on this, I mean, I try to remain open-minded and you guys have seen me change my analysis before on stream. Wouldn't be the first time. So if the court can convince me I'm wrong, I, I'm willing to be, I'm willing to be convinced because again, this is not necessarily the conclusion I wish to draw. So well, let's see if the court can do, can convince me I'm wrong. <sighs> Defendants argue that even if Amaya can establish First Amendment retaliation, her request fails because they have probable cause of arrest and they're entitled to qualified immunity. Both arguments fail. This should be good. Defendants' probable cause defense is based on Supreme Court holding in Nivens. The plaintiff brings a retaliatory arrest claim based on speech protected by the First Amendment must prove the absence of probable cause for an arrest. If the officer has probable cause of arrest, they may not assert retaliatory arrest which sounds suspiciously like exactly this to me. The test for probable cause is objective, asking whether a reasonable officer would have believed the person committed a crime. If so, the arrest is lawful even if it was mistaken. Hmm. Defendants insist that based on knowledge at the time, Sergeant had probable cause to arrest. I, 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 yeah. In relevant part, the provisions punish whoever in a public or private place engages in violent, abusive, indecent, profane, boisterous, unreasonably loud, or otherwise disorderly conduct, which is in which the conduct tends to cause or provoke a disturbance. Yeah. Defendants appear to recognize that none of the statute specific enumerations even remotely apply. Fair enough. It's not violent, it's not abusive, it's not indecent, it's not profane, it's not boisterous, it's not unreasonably loud, so. Yes, it doesn't fit in any of those categories. And thus focus on otherwise disorderly. Wisconsin courts have interpreted the phrase to encompass acts that corrupt public morals or outrage the sense of public decency. I'm thinking... Hmm. Defendants argue even if belief was ultimately mistaken, they have a reasonable basis to believe, uh, believe uh, because under the catch-all of disorderly conduct language, because he had been informed their Instagram post was causing significant disturbance, anxiety, fear, and concern, and even panic, which appears to be true at the time. Defendant's probable cause argument dramatically understates the probable cause analysis for disorderly conduct. Does it, though? If it's accepted, defendant's position would largely gut the First Amendment protection for freedom of speech. N no. Allowing police officers a free hand to wrongfully arrest anyone engaged in police is protected speech so long as the offending officer can point to a possible disturbance or perceived anxiety among those who oppose the speech. Uh, but this was actual in reality. It wasn't hypothetical. Like, that, that conclusion doesn't follow. The conclusion doesn't follow. Defendant's position would largely gut the First Amendment, allowing them to arrest so long as they could point to possible disturbance or perceived anxiety. This is, in fact, reality. The court's analysis is a little off point. Accordingly, the Wisconsin Supreme Court has held that the speech that falls within the protection of First Amendment may not be published, published as disorderly conduct. Well, no, no S, Sherlock. No less, Sherlock. I mean, yeah, but that goes to the entire thing in the first place, right? Right? It, it, yeah, that goes to the entire thing in the first place. So again, if you're going into the middle of a Starbucks and yelling the sky is blue or the sky is brown, take your pick, you know, that speech is protected, but you're still creating a disorder. I, I Yeah, the, the court's parade of horribles are not really working for me right now. Defendants offer no answer to this precedent, which removes any basis for probable cause. The precedent doesn't make any sense the way you're citing it. Because of my social media posts, also you're a federal court. 
because Amaya's social media posts were protected speech. Yeah. Uh, Klomp could not have reasonably believed they had probable cause to arrest her family. The problem fails as a matter of law. Uh, no. With all possible respect to the district court, I respectfully disagree. Uh, under my understanding of the law. Um, take take your example of choice. Take protected speech. Take the most protect. I mean, take the most protected speech you can dream up. You know, what would be the most protected speech you can possibly dream up? It would it would have it would either have to be political or religious, because that that's usually at the height of the, that's usually at the top of the pyramid. Uh, political because you're directly con potentially directly contradicting the first the government, which is principally the point of the First Amendment, right? So pol pro political speech is at the highest because you might be contradicting the government. So you need the most protection and church because it's one of our most sacred values. So take your pick again, walk into the middle of Starbucks or walk into the middle of, you know, the bar and start yelling at the top of your lungs, your political slogan or religious messaging of choice. Still, I think you're going to have a problem. I respectfully disagree. Defendants fare no better with their invocation of qualified immunity. It is well established that qualified immunity does not apply to requisites for declaratory relief. Yeah, but the problem here is that you're you in order for to, in order for it to be okay. I mentioned this before because it hasn't been set up before. I don't. Yeah, I don't know about that one. They cannot use qualified immunity as a defense to the declaratory judgment claim. Since my damages are not an issue, the court will not reach whether or not qualified immunity would have appeared in the case. Okay. Money damages are not an issue. That doesn't mean money isn't an issue. Money damages is I give you money or I order you to give money for the harm you've caused, right? Money, monetary damages would be sheriff, you pay Amaya. $10,000 for the bad. That would be monetary damages. But as I mentioned several times, because they're a prevailing party under 1983, which is the only reason we can be in federal court in the first place. Remember, we're in federal court. The only reason we can be there is under 1983. Because they're a prevailing party, that means under 1988, they can seek costs, which are not monetary damages. So they could seek fees and attorney's times and so forth and so on. That's not monetary damages. <sighs> the motion for injunctive release seeks to enjoin defendants from citing her or her parents' disorderly conduct. Yeah, we can't we can just skip all the injunctive relief analysis. The injunctive relief analysis is really simple in the end of the day. Defendants said declaratory relief would be enough. So, I mean, you know, there you go. So we can dismiss it in like one line. So we don't need all that. Conclusion. The First Amendment is not a game setting for the government to toggle on and off. Interesting analogy. It applies in times of tranquility and times of strife. While defendants in this case may believe their actions serve the greater good, which is a bit condescending, I have to say, it, that belief cannot insulate them. Demanding a 16-year-old remove their protected speech from Instagram is a First Amendment violation, declaratory judgment granted. Signed, the judge. Yeah, so... Yeah, so in, in my humble in my humble opinion, as, as, as an attorney, my humble opinion... In my in my legal judgment, I think the district court is wrong. I think it's wrong at point one of the analysis. And even if it's correct at point one of the analysis, if I screwed that up somehow, I'm convinced the probable cause analysis is correct. They they cite this one line from a Wisconsin Supreme Court case. It can't literally mean what it says. It can't literally mean what it says. Because if it literally, because what it said was, hold on, I'm saying there has to be other stuff. There's more things beyond the sentence. That's what I'm trying to say. 
So apparently the Wisconsin Supreme Court said that speech that falls within the protection of the First Amendment may not be punished as disorderly conduct. Okay, that sentence cannot mean what it says. There are other sentences. And the reason that I know that is because if it did, protect the speech, what would be protect the speech? Like yelling, um, you know, being on a street corner and saying the government sucks. You don't even necessarily have to be yelling at the bar for that matter. Let's just say you were like at normal speech and you just kept saying the same thing over and over and over again. And people around you were getting bothered or the Starbucks, which is a better example because it's relatively quiet in Starbucks. So even if you weren't yelling, if you're just saying it like normal speaking volume, like if you're on the street corner, you can do that. It's protected speech. Like, you know, vote Davis for governor. You can stand on the street corner and say to anyone who happens to be walking by vote, vote Davis for governor. That's protected speech. In fact, it is the apex of protected speech because political it is the very highest of political, uh, the very highest of speech. But you take the most protected speech you can dream up, vote Davis for governor, and you go into your Starbucks and you just keep saying it over and 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 over. Yeah, the Starbucks can ask you to leave. So there you're trying to tell me that Wisconsin says no disorderly conduct for that bs bs you are at best misquoting and at worst fundamentally misrepresenting what the wisconsin supreme court surely had to say it, it, no that doesn't make any sense no so i am yeah, i i think yeah so th this is this is a problem you know so i yeah I, I don't I don't think this. These are bad, bad analogies. A better example would be if she put up a billboard. Okay, well, I was just trying to point out that, yeah, I was just trying to point out it would be the same. Uh, so yeah, sure, it would be the same if she pulled out a billboard. It would be the same if she, instead of doing an Instagram post, I don't know, handed out flyers, maybe put them in the mail. The mail's protected. Maybe mail them out to everybody. Maybe she put up flyers on local bulletin boards and it was causing disruption. So sure. I mean, it's maybe, maybe she has some money. And so it would be the same as if she, it would be the same as if she bought a full page ad in her newspaper. I mean, you know, that would be the same, right? It's written communication and put that in newspaper. Uh, I, I think you're there. Uh, I think you're, I think you're there or I, yeah. So, and for that matter, I, again, if the, it's not like the newspaper doesn't get special first amendment protections, the newspaper doesn't get more or less first amendment protections than you or I, they're just the same as everybody else. The first amendment applies to everybody equally, right? So if the first amendment, so yeah, the first amendment allows you to make up lies. So suppose the New York times, because they have the ability to make lies, let's suppose that they, you know, let's have a laugh on April 1st, and they make a front page story that's a lie about a chemical spill in, I don't know, New York. And if you go outside and breathe the air, the chemicals will get to you and cause long-term damages. Is it a lie? Yes. Is it protected speech? Are you, are you serious? You, ser you seriously don't think you can go after the New York Times for that? for inducing that panic and the harm? You really? I don't think so. I don't think so. Or what if instead of a chemical spill, what if they made up a completely fictional disease? Or what if it's a real disease, but it doesn't have, it doesn't, it isn't affecting New York, you know? Cases of polio have spiked. Polio on the rampage throughout New York, stay inside. I mean, someone in New York, I guess, theoretic, or, you know, what's, or, or Ebola, or, you know, pick your, pick your disease vector of choice over here. If the New York Times just makes up stuff and puts it on their front page, you really think they're protected from lawsuit? I don't think so. I don't think so. Moniker says they safely told everyone the air was safe at ground zero on 9-11. Well, they, they might have been liable for that if, yeah, if you can show now, if you can trace the damages to that, which is a little bit hard, but 
also it would depend why they said it. Did they say it because they were reporting what a government official had told them? Then that would be different, right? If they're saying that, you know, you know, so and so at the health department says air safe, safe to breathe, that's a lot different than them just making it up. So it would depend. How did they do it? Yeah. Yeah. I, I you know, just just pick your analogy of the choice. World of War bro broadcast. You're closer. Yeah, you're closer. World World of War broadcast. You're closer there. A lot closer, yeah. All right, so let's see if there's questions, which I'm sure there are. I've been ignoring you for a while. Hold on, let's read this. Uncivil law. Is that the same district judge that said the state judges are enforcing the law? No. It's in a completely different circuit. It's Ohio. So it's Sixth Circuit instead of Fifth. So, no. Matt said, just saying, what relevant law? Okay. Uh... Azeroth said, what I want to know is how a woman has untouchable stat status for abortion. But the dis God disappears the moment the government starts forcing any other medical procedure. That's a very good question. And Rikita has pointed this out as well. Yeah, why is my body, my choice true for abortion, but not true for like any other medical procedure known to man? I, I don't know. It's a good question. Vinithius Prime said, like AOC, wherever I go, I stand out and see the show. Unlike AOC, people like me. Ouch. Matt said, so in Sojourner versus Edwards, the Fifth Circuit talked about, okay, we, that's old stuff. I'm sorry. I'm reading old stuff. I'm, how do these old chats get back? Where are these chats coming from? Anyways, pink and blue, I mean that much to you. It seems your predictions panned out. Well, we'll see. yeah. Uh, Internet Communicator said, are you going to cover the Epic leak? I don't know what leak that is, so I don't know, but maybe. Hose Med said, my bad. Hose Med said, it's not that low, it's more than reasonable suspicion. Yeah, I mean, no. Depends what you mean. Do you mean reasonably articulable suspicion? Reasonably articulable suspicion is very low. Probable cause is a little bit higher. You're right. It's, yeah. Reasonable suspicion... Yeah, you have to be you have to be careful with that one. Yeah. Reasonable articulable suspicion is the phraseology you want. Matt says, but you don't need clearly established. I discuss why you do. Rogue says, all I said is you're looking a little orange. Noted. Uh, it must it might be the light source because it's a little bit warm, uh, but I think it's better than the bright ones anyway. Hose Matt, I just don't see what unrest it was eagerly, even arguable, likely to cause, even if it was a lie. People might get mildly apprehensive and school administrators might have to take some calls. I mean, people were in a panic. Yeah, people were, call not only was school administrators calling, but they were calling each other and people were worried and, you know, it was causing an actual panic, as, as I'm sure. Remember, early days of COVID, when we don't know much about COVID, what this dangerous disease is. And, you know, people are worried. And then, uh, the judge had a nice line of maybe they should have been more worried, which I which was pretty hilarious. But yeah. Melanie says, was Amaya not sharing the doctor's opinion that she likely had COVID? It wouldn't matter. As I said, it wouldn't matter either way. Because yeah, her father shared that information that they were diagnosed with COVID. But it wouldn't matter either way. And the reason it doesn't matter either way is because, you know, people who are breaking the law make up all kinds of shit. So yeah, Amaya telling them or the father telling them that you know there was there that they were diagnosed with covid what the officer knows is that there's no there's no been no positive test and he knows that from competent me medical authority so what would a reasonable officer do a reasonable officer would think they're lying I mean, it seems to me that says so they could have arrested the people who were claiming that this was election fraud seems to be the conclusion of this live reasoning no matt Matt says, I see a difference here, though. They weren't asking them to stop speech, but retract old speech, forcing them to speak. I don't know what you're talking about. Johnny says, you're doing great. Thank you. So if this Wisconsin law had already been adjudicated under Wisconsin courts, that money comes against our real probable cause. There's no way it does. There is no way on this earth that that sentence from the Wisconsin Supreme Court can possibly mean anything like what it says, because there must be other stuff. 
There's no way. There's no way. As I tried to illustrate. Wouldn't that be trespassing rather than disorderly conduct if you don't leave? Well, it can be both. You know, because he it would be both trespassing and disorderly conduct. So, yes. Right? He He's causing a disruption and he refuses to be. It's belief, so it's disorderly conduct and trespassing. Why not both, right? Ricardo says, I think the police would charge you for trespass if you refuse to leave Starbucks. Yes, they would charge you for both. Right? It's a crime not to leave Starbucks when they ask you to. That's trespass. It's a crime to cause disorder within the Starbucks. This is disorderly conduct. They can arrest you for both. Why not both? <laughs> why, why one or the other? They're both illegal. Joe says, you have this for the wrong stream. What does that mean? I have this for the wrong stream. What does that even mean? I have this for the wrong stream, Joe's. I don't know. Ricardo says, but the news claims facts that are false all the time. They're never charged. Okay. Yeah. But there's again, again, I've made this clear, but I'll try again. It's not a crime to lie. The first amendment protects lies, right? It protects lies. So the fact that newspapers report lies is not disorderly conduct. But if they produce lies that do cause disorder, especially if they're manifest, especially, and we're assuming, again, they know them to be lies, and manufactured, right? Whole different ballgame. Oh, yeah, I said that because you're reading questions from the Texas. I don't know why the stream was, I don't know why it was going to be old questions from the past, but for some reason it was. <laughs> don't try to circumvent my bot um all right so now i'll take yeah these lies have caused actual war see spanish american war well in that case you might be able to sue the new york times right i mean they caused a lot of damage so i don't know if anyone ever tried but you know again you also have to be does the newspaper know they're false because in my example in my example i was saying that they're just out and out false they're making it up just to prove the point so yeah it's a crime to lie to a police officer conducting an interrogation that's true it's obstruction and if it's the feds it's a whole other set of crimes Mary became a supporter. Thank you, Mary. The opinion ignores time, place, manner. I, I am, apparently. This is this is not a well this is not a well reasoned opinion. In my judgment, I think the court is wrong. All right, so let me show you what the problem is. Let me show you what the problem is. Because Matt was saying, oh, there's no money involved. There's no money involved. Wait till you read further. Okay, Matt, let me let me educate you a little bit here, Matt. Just keep reading. There's no money involved. No monetary damages. All right, let me show you why there's a problem. Five dollars for Ricardo Ospinia. This whole thing was a mess. School men should have gone there, not the police. I agree. I agree completely. All right, kids. Here's why. Here's the why we have a problem section. Here's the why we have a problem section because the court said, "Oh, no monetary damages." All right. So here's why we have a problem. This would be 42 U.S.C. 1988. Proceedings in vindication of civil rights. Section B. In any action or proceeding to enforce a provision of sections 1981, 1981A, 1982, 1983, 1985, and 1986 of this title, 
of Title IX, the Religious Land Use Act, Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, or any section of 12361 of Title 34, the court in its discretion may allow the prevailing party, other than the United States, a reasonable attorney's fees as part of costs, except in any action brought against judicial officer for act or omission, blah, 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 because this is a judicial officer, so it doesn't matter. So that's why it matters, because money is a factor here, because the court can award damages, and it seems like this court would be inclined to. 42 U.S.C. 1988, people. I know the law sometimes too well. It's, yeah. Of course, the court doesn't have to. It does say in its discretion. It doesn't have to. But it does seem like the kind of court that would. So, you know. That's why money is a factor. What else? I will now accept I will now accept criticism of my critique. If you have criticism of my critique from a legal perspective because it'll be legal education. So I mean you've heard both legal analysis, you heard my legal analysis and you heard the court's legal analysis. So I guess which did you find more persuasive? Incidentally, the poll is, seems to be 63% for Lake Travis. You guys are liking the background of, of Lake Travis, so that worked out really well. We can do a new poll. Who do you find more persuasive, me, the court, or me, or the court? It'll be entertaining. Who is more legally persuasive? <laughs> the U.S. District Court. Ya yeah, boy on civil law. So 211 votes. You guys are liking the Lake Travis background. The court because I want to be right. Now that's not a good enough reason. I, I, I want it to be right too. I mean, but you know, no. <laughs> I love to see an AI like Watson try to argue a case in court. It could scan decades of legal opinion, pull keywords, and craft an answer. Uh, Watson does have um, some AI to help with legal briefs, um, so they they have started some stuff on that. But it, it, I don't think it can do real time legal analysis. But it does have some software for briefs if you're in, into that kind of thing. Where's my man on civil law? All right, so I, I, I guess because I didn't watch the streams, um, Viva had a stream on this, I understand. Uh, would it be correct to say that Viva's analysis might have been somewhat different than mine? Just a guess. I'm, I'm guessing that Viva said something along the lines of praise be, praise be. Oh, I wish we had more of this like in the Cal Ca Canada. You know, it's nice to see a court standing up for the First Amendment, standing up for people's rights. Something along those lines was Viva's opinion, if I had to guess. Yeah. Not a stream background? Okay. Yeah, I figured as much. I figured as much. But I think the analysis is wrong. Now, I think there's a half decent chance, although. I really still think I'm right, but there's there's a there's a there's a there's a credible chance a credible chance I'm wrong on the first part of the retaliatory First Amendment analysis. I don't think I am, but there's a credible argument. But the QI now the the QI analysis or the, not the QI analysis uh, because it's not available in declaratory relief apparently, but the uh, probable cause analysis is just wrong. It's just wrong. Even if, I mean, the, 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 the court's examples in, in the as applied challenge, well, if this is true, it would mean they could act anytime, many times. Like, no, it doesn't necessarily mean that, even though it's kind of broadly worded, but, you know, yeah. <laughs> Viva began with vindicated in all caps on the title. Yeah, I figured that would roughly be, uh, I figured that would rough pick a different courthouse every stream. That's a nice uh, idea, Matt. That's a nice idea. Viva has a 10% correct rate. 
Yeah, he's he's not a US, U.S. lawyer. That's true. Yeah, he's briefer than me. Well, that's well, I drew a complex legal analysis, and I also had to explain my legal analysis and in major parts because the court disagreed with me. So I had to explain where I think the court is getting it wrong. So if so, the, the next question is uh, so I guess the next question is does Amaya ask for fees or their attorneys ask for fees? Does the judge grant fees? It is discretionary. And if so, does the judge, and then does the judge, yeah, then then we're off to appeal. And the appeal will be, the appeal will reverse. It has to. It has to. On appeal, could the court find some way to rule it's overbroad or just need to stop a qualified immunity? On a facial challenge, I don't think you can get there. I don't think you can get there. Because what otherwise disorderly conduct might mean, I don't think is infinite in scope. And besides, yeah, I, I don't think you can get there. Um, that would be interesting to try to say uh, on his face. As an as-applied challenge, it's a loser. Um, on an on his facial challenge, I, I think you're going to run into problems there because I, I would be willing to bet that pretty much every disorderly conduct is written roughly the same way. Everywhere. I mean, they might use slightly different words, but, you know, we all kind of understand what disorderly conduct is because they all written basically the same. Now, it might make some difference at some point of some fine point of the analysis, but, you know, in 99% of the situations, you know, we have a pretty good idea what this is. They did ask for money and they ignored it. Well, the court, yeah, the court didn't deny the monetary relief, which is within the court's province. But they can come back and ask for court costs if they want. They can file a motion. Just how curious, how does the state Supreme Court ruling when it matters to come clearly established under 1983? It doesn't. Yeah, if, if you're doing a 1983 analysis, state Supreme Court decisions are irrelevant. Right? The only reason the state Supreme Court analysis is relevant is because of um, the state probable cause issue, which is a matter of state law. So it's not relevant for your 1983 analysis. But it, it is, rel well, I guess it's relevant in so much as the defense for probable cause would have to rely on state law. So that would be a state substantive law issue. But otherwise, the Wisconsin State Supreme Court's decisions are relevant. There were no monetary damages. That's true. We've discussed that. But damages for costs and legal fees are still possible under 42 U.S.C. 1988. So money is still a factor here. I think disorderly conduct is interpreted as any disrespect or disobedience to the law enforcement officer. Sometimes that's true. Sometimes that is definitely true. But that's not the situation today. Yeah. So will we see these guys on appeal? I don't know. Someone had to, someone had to exhaust a lot of legal time and energy. I don't think Amaya was paying for it. I think it might have been some foundation that was paying for it. But still, the, the foundation might want to get costs. You know, so do they ask for costs? I don't know. And even if they don't, even if they don't ask for costs, strictly speaking, the, the, they could still appeal it. They just might not have as much motivation. I mean, it's still a declaratory relief. They could still appeal even without the cost. So, I mean, they can appeal either way and say the declaratory judgment is wrong because we had we had the probable cause to arrest, which they totally did. So the declaratory relief is wrong, or the or maybe yeah. So yeah, yeah. It was a free speech group. If no money is involved, there be no appeal. I don't know. As I just said, they could appeal. They could appeal the declaratory relief and say the declaratory relief is an error. They wanted to. They have standing. They want me to cover the Wisconsin case they cited. I guess I could. I guess I could, since but the court pulled out one sentence from it, and I'm like, oh. in Ray Douglas of 2001. I guess I could cover it, but they didn't though. Okay, Eric, I'm going to help you out here. Eric, you're killing me. Eric, you're killing me. Eric, you don't ask 
for you don't ask for it up front. You'd ask for it now. There's a statute, 42 U.S.C. 1983. It says the prevailing party can get costs and legal fees. They could file a motion now in the case today. So, yeah, there's a statute. They could file a motion, right? There's a, an opinion and there's a judgment that said declaratory relief, declaratory relief for the plaintiff, but that doesn't necessarily mean the case is over because there can be things after that. For example, 42 U.S.C. 1988. So they haven't yet. They might. 42 U.S.C. 1988. Yes, the award of damages. We've covered it a couple times. We read it on screen. 42 U.S.C. 1988. I can read it again. Why not? Since we're discussing it. 42 U.S.C. 1988. In any action to enforce a provision of Section 1983, the court in its discretion may allow the prevailing party, other than the United States, a reasonable attorney's fees as part of costs, except in any action brought against a judicial officer for act or omission taken in such officer's capacity. Such officers shall not be liable for costs, including attorney's fees, unless action was clearly in excess of that officer's jurisdiction, which this isn't a judicial officer, so the entire back half of that paragraph is completely irrelevant but they can get attorney's fees if they want. And as I pointed out, they don't they could still appeal even without it because the the, the relief the, the the relief is wrong. So, yeah. All right. Saying your opinion in a stream it's causing panic attacks. They call the cops, cops to your doorstep. You were causing panic, right? Well, possibly, I guess, if it was causing enough of a disturbance, maybe. Yeah, possible. Uh, what authority did bails work under? They work under the court's authority. Jonathan gave me 499 and said, your analysis of the Texas abortion law was eye-opening. I disagree with the law completely, but agree with your analysis, how cleverly it's written. Thank you. That doesn't mean it's undefeatable. It's one of the reasons we're tracking U.S. versus Texas, because we think, or at least I hope, that's going to provide some really great legal analysis as we learn along the way. But I appreciate that. Um, yeah, it doesn't mean that U.S. can't win, but Texas definitely tried really, really hard. So... I appreciate it. I hope it's appealed to you see me be wrong all over again. You know, fair enough. Fair enough, you know. And, and that I could be wrong. I the court of appeals could disagree with me three to zero. You know, I'm not God. I'm not God. I, I just give you my, my legal opinion. Sometimes it's wrong. Sometimes like sometimes it's pretty wrong. Sometimes it's sometimes it's eight to one at the U.S. Supreme Court wrong. Or sometimes it's like nine to zero from 1930s wrong. You know, I mean, Wicker, Wickard v. Filburn was a unanimous case. The Supreme Court unanimously said I was wrong in the 1930s. Well, I think they're full of it. So, you know, yeah. We'll see. All right, I'm going to end the stream now. I think this has been fun and enjoyable. If you've been enjoying the stream, please remember what? Wait for what? What? Why am I waiting here to come here? Wicker v. Phil Burton was unanimous. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Chevron was unanimous. I think hour was eight to one. 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, where was I? Yeah. If you've been enjoying this channel, please remember to give it a like. If you're not subscribed already, please remember to subscribe. I will give you the best legal analysis I can, regardless of my personal opinions or wishes or dreams. And I'll tell you how it is, for better or worse. And try to give you intelligent commentary about courts and where they get it right and where they get it wrong. As I understand the law. Ye. And did you know for 99 cents you can become an uncivilian? It's true. Do you see how some people have those little icons next to their name, like A. Hedinger and Moniker 2 and Noli? They all have those little, little scale icons next to their name of different colors. You can get a scale icon too. It's because they're members of the channel. There should be a join button on your screen. And if you're on an iOS device, from time to time, the bot has been reminding you, providing a link that you can click to do that. So you can become an uncivilian for 99 cents and become a member of the channel. How fun. How fun. And that will be all good. So hopefully next time around, I'll be back with a little less black pill action. But until then, as friends, it's been well. Cheers. And goodbye.